Thanks for joining today. Um, we're really excited to present on our ICS Plus solution. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, just agenda, today we'll be introducing our new products and going through our kind of entire combiner box line. We'll talk about National Electric Code requirements in the 2014 uh, NEC pertaining to combiner boxes and go over kind of the adoption um, and talk about how our new solution complies with those new requirements. We'll also do a technical overview to go over the solutions, the product features, uh, and the installation and wiring. I'll be handing part of that off to Mark Mays. Um, he'll be presenting some of that stuff. Uh, finally, we'll go over competition and materials, so going over you know, who else is out there um, and some of the product materials we have available. And as Hannah said, we'll wrap, be wrapping up um, with questions, so Q&A section. Okay. <clears throat> So Outback's entire combiner box offering. So um, we do have a few other, a few solutions. Um, kind of on the left of your screen, we have our combiner boxes that provide basic combining and overcurrent protection. That's our Flexware FWPV8 and 12, as well as our um, ICS combiner boxes. We have, you know, between four and 12 string solutions. Um, really, we see the 8 and the 12 being used mostly with uh, applications that require two arrays, where our um, 4 and our 6 string, at least in our applications, are typically used with one array. Um, over on the right, we have, or sorry, yeah, on the right, we have our integrated combiner solution. That's our NEC solution we'll be talking about today. Um, another differentiator, so our older combiner boxes, our FWPV 8 and 12, are UL listed for breakers and fuses. Um, however, due to new requirement, regulatory requirements, um, our newer combiner boxes are only listed for fuses uh, because it pro fuses provide bidirectional overcurrent protection. So National Electric Code 2014, what's required for compliance? Um, there are really three new uh, requirements that pertain to combiner boxes that we're meeting with ICS Plus. First one, um, 690.11 DC arc fault protection. Uh, 2690.12 PV rapid shutdown and 3690.15C DC combiner disconnect. And our new ICS Plus solution uh, <coughs> meets all of those. Okay. So arc fault protection, this was a requirement in the 2011 National Electric Code, um, was updated in 2014. So all PV systems 80 volts DC or greater require an arc fault, a listed arc fault circuit interrupture. Um, arc fault is an unintended arc created by current flowing through an air gap between two conductors. Um, arcs are identified by their electrical noise, um, though PV equipment may also create noise that's similar to an arc, and that could lead to nuisance tripping. So we have a couple of images down below. Um, the image on the left <coughs> shows uh, an inverter, the electrical noise of an inverter operating without an arc, and that's that dark blue uh, line. And then above it, you see uh, the electrical noise of an inverter with an arc, and that's that light purple um, line. And you can see there's a difference between those two. However, the image on the right shows a, a string inverter that actually has noise that's similar to an arc, so that's that dark blue versus the red line. And you can see that um, they kind of overlap. So sometimes there, it's difficult for um, arc, fault, arc fault detectors to actually differentiate between an arc and uh, an inverter. Um, to, so rapid shutdown, this is a new requirement in the 2014 NEC. Um, my understanding is it's being updated in the 2017 NEC. But PV rapid shutdown um, is just really a way for firefighters or first responders to respond quickly um, and safely to de-energize controlled PV conductors um, during an emergency. Um, what control conductors are, so those are, um, those include the PV circuits from within 10 feet of the PV array all the way down to a charge controller in our systems or an inverter in a grid direct system. And uh, it, control conductors must de be de-energized within 10 seconds to a touch safe power level. Um, the image I'm showing here, this is an image from Solar Pro. It's showing uh, a rapid shutdown system on a grid direct system on a uh, grid direct PV installation. And you can see within, kind of close to the PV array, within 10 feet, you have a combiner box or source 
some sort of disconnect close to the PVRA. Um, down below you have the inverter. And in this system, um, the loss of the AC power actually actuates a PV rapid shutdown event. Um, there's a little bit more complexity with a battery-based system. We'll be going into that. Um, when rapid shutdown came out, there was a lot of confusion. I have a quote here from ReWrenches. Um, there wasn't a UL standard for rapid shutdown when the code came out. So um, there are a lot of different solutions out there. Um, you know, not a lot of not a lot of ways for uh, installers to actually comply with this because there wasn't there weren't any listed solutions. Um, Outfax is actually the first solution that's listed for PV rapid shutdown through UL um, for grid-based and uh, battery-based systems. <coughs> um, finally, the DC combiner disconnect. So this is 690.15. DC combiners mounted on roofs must have a low break disconnecting means located in or within six feet of the DC combiner. Um, we're meeting this with, uh, you know, we have a disconnect on our combiner box. It's actually utilizing a contactor. Uh, that contactor has three purposes. It's the local disconnect. It's actually the interrupter for our arc fault circuit interruption. And it's also the remote disconnect for a rapid shutdown event. It's also um, listed to L508I. So it's the contactor itself is listed for um, PV manual disconnect switches. So National Electric Code Compliance, um, this is as I think beginning of this month, this is from um, the Electrical Code Coalition, they update this either every month or every other month. This just kind of gives an overview of who's complying to which code. Um, though lo local jurisdictions may be complying or may have exceptions. So here in Washington State where we're located, um, we're actually seeing that uh, arc fall and rapid shutdown was deferred into July 1st, 2000. So that's actually not, hasn't been um, enforced until, it will be starting to enforce this uh, next month. Um, oh, sorry. And also over on the right, you see that graph. So um, although a lot of states are compliant to 2014, some of the major markets are not complying yet. So you can see California's major PV market, um, they're actually still compliant to 2011. So most of the market's still on the 2011 code. Um, so kind of a quick overview of what ICS Plus is. Mark will be diving more into this, but um, you can kind of see, so on a house we have our ICS Plus combiner box up on the roof within 10 feet of the PV array. Um, this combiner box is listed to UL1741 with PV rapid shutdown, and also listed to UL1699B for um, arc fault circuit interruption. Down below, um, close to the service meter, we have our RSI box, our rapid shutdown initiator. This is also listed to UL1741 with PV rapid shutdown. Um, over in our load centers, we have two components that uh, both also UL listed for rapid shutdown. Um, we have our uh, power supply, our DC power supply that provides power to the entire circuit. Um, that's a panel mount power supply and also a, um, a relay trip circuit breaker. So um, that disconnects close to the charge controller in our system. Okay, next we'll be going into technical overview. I'm going over the solutions, the product features, and the installation and wiring. So we have um, you know, quite a few components for the ICS Plus or different offerings. Um, we actually have package solutions for easy ordering. So we have a ICS Plus 1, 2, and 4 package solution. These are really just bundled solutions for either 1, 2, or 4 PV arrays. Um, these solutions, or I guess these packages are specific for battery applications um, in that they provide the DC power supply. Um, however, we, we also are offering all of these components a la carte. So we have the combiner box, that's that first part number down below, um, the rapid shutdown, initiator, the power supply, a couple of relay trip breakers, um, we're also offering labels. Um, so those can all be ordered separately. Um, Mark will be going into this, but the requirements for a battery-based system and the requirements for a grid direct system are a little bit different. So um, when used with a grid direct system, you only need some components. You don't need all the components. So really, um, you wouldn't be ordering packaging for packages for a grid direct system. Um, so what's included in a, a package solution? So this is an example of ICS Plus. We have kind of four components. We have the combiner box, the RSI, the power supply, and a relay trip breaker. And we're also offering um, you know, a, a lot of 
spares. So these are, um, you know, all major components are replaceable. So, you know, the cable glands, contactor, arc fault. So if there is a failure, um, these are all completely serviceable products. All right, I'll be handing this over to Mark now. Um, he'll be going over operation and installation. Thanks, Andrea. So I'm going to go into a little more detail about uh, the installation of some of these components. So I'm going to start uh, with the uh, this combiner box and talk about the rapid shutdown. Then these two components here that will go into uh, one of our load centers or optionally mount to the, uh, the outside of the load center. And then at the end, um, I'll kind of show how, you know, the system view of how this is wired uh, using our, our quick start guide diagram. So, so we're going to start uh, talking about the uh, combiner box. Uh, this section on the right-hand side of the combiner box uh, all comes pre-wired. Uh, the only thing that you'll need to do is land your strings into the string fuses here. They go through the uh, arc fault detector device. That's this black device on the top of the uh, string fuses. They get combined onto one side of the contactor. And then the output side of the contactor, this is your power conductor that goes down to the remote trip breaker. And then the other side of the remote trip breaker goes to the input to the charge controller. Um, so there are uh, three things that will uh, trip the contactor. One is an arc fault. An arc fault will open up the contactor. The uh, disconnect uh, switch over here on the right-hand side, you can see the in view there. Uh, that will also uh, open up the contactor. Then the rapid, rapid shut, shutdown initiator, the RSI, that is the third thing that can also uh, initiate a rapid shutdown on all the combiner boxes. And that would also open up this contactor. And then down, down below here, sort of an exploded view uh, of the power. There's a 24 volt power supply, which I'll talk about in a little bit, that goes in the uh, uh, Outback Load Center. It, it gets power from the uh, battery, either a 20 or 4, 48 volt battery system. And then that this runs power to the uh, the RSI device, as well as all the combiner boxes. And then there's a couple control lines here that I'll, I'll talk about later as well. So uh, nuisance stripping, this was one of the things that we had heard about uh, quite a bit from our competitors, people complaining about uh, them tripping, false tripping, having to climb up on the roof to reset them, and all this. So we did a fair amount of testing. We, we looked at two different manufacturers. Uh, our engineering group uh, tested two. One had some problems with nuisance tripping. We went back, they adjusted their firmware, made some other adjustments, and so we uh, set, that, set that up. Um, I kind of led the testing in our application engineering test lab uh, with one system. It was an AKW radium with a 2KW array, and we ran the negative lead of the array through the arc fault detector. Uh, uh, and we left our fault detector very close to the load center. So if there was any uh, radiated uh, noise, uh, we could pick that up. We hooked up some noisy loads, uh, compact fluorescent lights, light dimmers, electronic ballasts. We ran them 24-7 for two weeks, uh, monitoring for trips with a data logger. Uh, we even hooked up a vacuum cleaner to it for a while, which is like the, the worst noisy load you can have in a house. So we really feel like we really ran this uh, through the, the ringer, if you will, uh, for uh, you know, detecting uh, false trips. One thing nice about our system is if you do get uh, a nuisance trip, which can happen on any system, uh, you can uh, remove the power from the combiner box using the RSI device that's down below, typically uh, by the uh, revenue meter, and so you can activate the rapid shutdown, which will uh, power down the uh, arc fault detector, power back up again, and that'll reset it. Uh, there's also a way you could, if you wanted to, even even do that remotely, which I'll talk about later. Um, so this is kind of a uh, the main overview of our arc fault. We feel like it's pretty uh, robust and, and re reliable uh, solution we've come up with. 
So you can have up to six different or six total uh, combiner boxes. Uh, you would just daisy chain them together so you get the power and control lines that come up from the RSI uh, rapid shutdown initiator and those just get daisy chained from one uh, to the other. On here, this green wire here, the green terminal, uh, this is the uh, arc fault. So any combiner that detects an arc fault will activate this line. So this, all these combiners that you have there are in parallel. Uh, it will show up, uh, like say number two uh, saw an arc fault, the light would show up here, and then also there would be uh, an FCI indicator down on, on the rapid shutdown. So you could see in both locations uh, an arc fault occurred, and then you could see specifically uh, which combiner uh, or combiners uh, saw the uh, arc fault. Um, and then the this is uh, showing the remote trip breakers down below. So the power conductors are going to come into um, these remote trip breakers, which are located down in the uh, outback load center. So, so the open circuit for the control conductor comes from the output of this contactor. Uh, and then the other end of it is at the input to the uh, charge controller down in the load center. Couple different layout options. Um, there is uh, a line that comes from the uh, breaker control power supply that comes down on this top line here, comes into the RSI device. Then the output, which is a slightly different set of control lines with the same power, it would have to pass through the load center, but it could go up in the same conduit to the uh, combiner box as long as the insulation uh, of those control lines is at the same or higher voltage as the uh, uh, insulation for the uh, power conductors. So this is one way you could just use one conduit. Um, it, it is going to have to kind of pass through here on this side uh, because the control lines are not exactly the same that go into the RSI versus the ones that come out. Another way uh, you could do this, uh, you could run from the a breaker control power supply up to the RSI uh, and then run the other set of control lines and power up to the combiner box. This way um, you could surface mount those. They're, they are low voltage, so they're not required to be in a conduit. The uh, power uh, uh, conductors uh, could be in a conduit, but you cannot pass those power conductors through the RSI. The RSI is only rated for 24 volts nominal, I think 30 volts max. Uh, so you, you could, uh, this would be an, an alternate way to do that. So you could surface mount the control wires and uh, put a conduit on the uh, power conductors. Okay, the rapid shutdown, uh, it does have an indicator, uh, solar on, solar off, as well as the arc fault, very simple indicators and then just the on-off. So it, it basically is going to uh, initiate the rapid shutdown uh, up on the combiner box side, and it's also going to tell the remote trip breaker to go off and also sense when it goes off. So looking inside uh, this section here, these are the, this is the breaker safe and the breaker trip. These are the uh, trip control to the remote trip breaker as well as the status that it did in fact go off. And then here's the arc fault coming from the combiner saying, hey, an arc fault occurred. And the other one is a, an RSI safe that indicates that all the combiner boxes are in fact um, shut off safely. There are some optional connections in here. Um, this first one is a, a, an RSI status command out so it can uh, you know, be uh, go to the internet, uh, an alarm, input on a, on a PLC. Also, I'll show you another way that can be used um, to, uh, to turn the inverter output off in a, in a special case. Uh, this RSI safe, this is just in parallel with our RSI safe, so if there's another system, uh, another inver inverter, another manufacturer in the system that has an indication of an RSI safe, uh, that could be connected in parallel here. 
Um, then this art, uh, art fault is just, again, if you wanted to have either an audible or a visual alert inside the house indicating that an art fault has occurred because that will take the uh, array offline, uh, you may want to have that inside the house to let the, alert the site owner. Uh, this RSI external in, you could, in fact, uh, remove this jumper that's there now. You could connect this to uh, like a dry contact relay, uh, say on the Radian or our uh, FNDC relay, which can be controlled via our optics RE. So you could, in fact, initiate an RSI or uh, use it to reset remotely uh, the combiner box if it saw an arc fault. So without having to roll your truck out there. So this would be uh, one use for this, uh, this input here. So I want to talk about, just briefly about this special case. Um, our ICS Plus system is listed. It's fully compliant. Uh, there are, however, some uh, interpretations of the code. Some uh, local uh, HJ may say that they want to see in the case where uh, the fire, there's a fire and the fire department pulls the revenue meter. Uh, that does put our battery-based inverter uh, into the invert mode, which does make this uh, backup load panel hot, if you will. Um, while that has nothing to do with the PV uh, uh, controlled conductors, um, some say they want that included because they pull the revenue meter, it does make this panel hot. So one thing you could do is you could take this J3 connector in the RSI, connect the two wires to our inverter uh, on off, pull the on-off jumper. That way, if there ever was uh, a rapid shutdown initiated, it would, uh, via this two-wire connection, tell our inverter to turn off. So if the revenue, revenue meter is pulled, uh, then the back of load panel will go dead. So uh, it shouldn't be required. Some may want to see it. Uh, it could just be an added safety feature. So it is there for if you choose to use it. Okay, now uh, we get into the load center. There's uh, two devices here. One is this uh, breaker control power supply box. So this is the 10-pin connector, and this is a uh, screw terminal uh, type of connector. So it's showing a 40-volt uh, connection here on pins 1 and 2. That could be 24 volts, whatever, if you have a 24-volt or a 40-volt uh, battery power supply. Uh, then the output, this is a 24-volt output that goes to the RSI and then gets passed up to the uh, combiner boxes. Um, these two lines, RSI breaker trip, that's what the RSI says, hey, <clears throat> trip the breaker. This other line here uh, indicated them, uh, as a green uh, connection, if you will. That's to indicate that the, the breaker did, in fact, trip. So. These, uh, on this uh, remote trip breaker, there's a couple flying leads here. They could go to pins 9 and 10. Those get activated if there's a trip signal from the RSI. And then there's a couple lines here on, uh, this is the sense, to, to sense that the, the breaker has tripped. And that comes back onto this pin 7 and 8. And then that would go back. Uh, up to the RSI and say, okay, the breaker has in fact tripped. So these are all connections that take place inside the load center. And uh, these four lines here, pins three through six, are the only ones that leave uh, the load center. If we, so if we take a look at the kind of the big system overview picture here, starting up the combiner box, we see our strings. Uh, kind of our strings each go into their own string fuse. Uh, the combined output goes to the contactor. Power conductors come down um, into a load center to our uh, terminal bus bar. From the terminal bus bar to the remote trip breaker, <clears throat> and then the other end goes to the uh, control. So this is the path. This is the control conductor path from the remote trip breaker through through the load center on up to the output of the contactor in the, in the uh, combiner box. That is the controlled path that we are trying to control and uh, make uh, dead or open circuit. And one thing I just want to point out here, 
this is really important. Um, this there is a polarity on this uh, breaker. This is a DC breaker. Uh, the load side that comes from the uh, combiner box goes to the this label. It's labeled uh, load positive, line negative. Those terms load and line might be counterintuitive, but that that is the way that it has to be connected. If you don't connect it this way, you could get a failure of this device. So it's really, really important that you make that connection proper. And then we went through all these other connections here and, and, and on up there. So again, the, the ones that go up in the combiner box, the arc fault, the parallel connection, the uh, remote trip safe, or the, the uh, RSI safe, that is a, a series connection. And so if you have a single one, you'll have to jump for that uh, RSI safe to the black or the DC minus or you would do that to the last combiner in the daisy chain. So that's pretty much it on the, on the wiring side of things. This is the uh, quick start guide, this wiring diagram that, that comes with the system. So there are a few other applications um, outside of Outback so um, that uh, you could use this out there because there are not a lot of good arc fault uh, detection systems out there. Um, so if you wanted to use this where uh, uh, say the PV rapid shutdown is not yet required or the application doesn't require it, so anything that's less than or equal to 600 volts and you only need the arc fault, um, this, uh, this is 300 volts, I believe that should be uh, 600 volts, right? Because the combiner yeah. box, yeah, that should say 600 volts. Uh, but the, the rapid shutdown is not required, the remote trip breaker is not required, just the power supply uh, that would provide power to the uh, combiner box and the uh, arc fault detection circuit. So that, that is a possibility uh, for you to use our system and that application. Also uh, battery based applications in the 300 to 600 volt range. Um, uh, and using a 24 to 40 volt battery bank because that's what we need to for our, our breaker control power supply. Our, however, our remote trip breaker is not rated above 300 volts. So if you are in a, in a, in a system that is using 300 to 600 volts, uh, then you would need a third party uh, PV uh, rapid shutdown equipment, equipment uh, which could be an inverter, a charge controller, a disconnect. That is rated to 600 volts. So that would take the place of this remote trip breaker and, and say our uh, charge controller. But the rest of the rapid shutdown system and combiner box could be used. So in grid direct applications where you're using a uh, say a 600 volt uh, inverter and a 600 volt application uh, that's non-battery based, um, you would need uh, third-party uh, PV uh, rapid shutdown equipment uh, as well, which could be embedded inside the inverter. Um, you also need uh, our Outback Power Break Control Power Supply is not rated for uh, um, isolated uh, applications. So you would need to acquire an isolated uh, Class II DC power supply up to 15 amps and 24 volts. And I think, Andrew, we're coming up with an application note or a source for this. That's correct, Mark. Yeah, so um, our, our power supply is DC to DC. Um, if with a grid direct system, you need an AC to DC power supply. Um, so we're writing an app note with a recommendation on that power supply. Um, that should be available by the maybe end of this month or mid next month. Mm -hmm. And yeah, most battery based systems have a, uh, have a connection from the DC minus to, to ground. So uh, you need to, to get an isolated power supply for that. Okay, so um, where the uh, rapid shutdown is not required or possibly the, uh, a lot of uh, grid direct inverters already have that function built in, um, but you only need the uh, arc fault uh, for whatever reason. Maybe the arc fault detection built in or it doesn't work well or doesn't exist. Um, you could use um, our, again, you would, you would need to use um, an isolated power supply uh, but you could use our combiner box with our arc fault detection up, up to 600 volts. Um, so that's another 
possible application. Okay, I'll uh, go ahead and turn it back over to you, Andrea. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, and I think um, really differentiating if you know if there's a region that's only complying or still complying to the 2011 electric code, they may just need arc fault, but they may not need rapid shutdown yet. Um, so they, in those cases, you could just use our combiner box and our um, you know some of our components. You wouldn't necessarily need the RSI. Um, so finally, I'll be kind of wrapping this up with the competition and materials, and then we'll have our Q and A. Uh, Q&A section at the end. So there are a lot of other solutions out there. Um, uh, few listed solutions that, that are actually listed to rapid shutdown. Um, most of the solutions out there, though, are specific for uh, grid direct applications and not necessarily for battery-based systems. Um, so it's kind of the grayed out uh, competitors that we have here. Um, there are combiner boxes that do have AFCI, I think, um, Selectria, Solution, um, Amtech, and SolarBox all have AFCI combiner boxes. Um, so our, really the other competitor that we see in this market is Midnight Solar. Um, they have their birdhouse and their rapid shutdown combiner boxes as well. Um, just kind of com quick comparison of Outback Solution versus Midnight. Um, our solution is completely listed for uh, rapid shutdown systems, so PV, RSS. Um, we also have a listed solution for arc fault protection in our combiner box. Um, we have packages, so simple to order, that work with one, two, or four uh, arrays for battery-based systems. And we also offer all components a la carte. Um, we also can reset our combiner box from the ground using our RSI, um, not for either a PV rapid shutdown event or an arc fault event can be reset um, by using that uh, RSI. Um, we also use off-the-shelf, ready available um, wires for our for our solution. So um, THHN, THWN-2, um, kind of readily available, no specific or um, unique wiring required. Um, we also, with a battery-based system, everything's DC, so we just need one power supply, um, you know, our, our breaker control power supply. Uh, we also have one power supply that works with 24 to 48 volt DC nominally rated battery banks. Um, and we're actually listed to work with third party PVRSEs. So if there's an inverter or charge controller or some sort of, sort of disconnect that's listed as a PV rapid shutdown equipment, um, we actually work with that. And our RSI can take in um, you know, signals from a third party PVRSE. Um, so uh, that kind of wraps up. Our, um, our webinar, we do have a lot of materials. I don't think our website is not quite updated with all of this. We're, um, we should be updating in the next couple of weeks. But for more information, please reach out to um, either sales at outbackpower.com or visit our website. Um, you know, we have our spec sheets, our website, our, our quick start guide. Um, we have our owner manuals. We also have you know, high, res, uh, high resolution images and CAD files available. Um, so that wraps it up for us. Um, we can go ahead and open up the Q&A. All right, great. Thanks, Andrea and Mark. Um, so just a reminder to everyone listening, you can submit your questions through that questions box on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, and we'll just start um, going through those. And also just a quick reminder is that the, uh, the survey will pop up once you exit the webinar. So be sure to complete that survey. Um, and then I will send you a copy of the presentation a little later today. And with that, we will go ahead and get started. Um, Andrea, this was a question from one of your earlier slides. Um, we have a dealer wondering if the batteries disconnect. So we have, um, you mean with a rapid shutdown event? Um, Correct. So, okay. Yeah, so um, what what's we interpret and um, uh, so no, not in our, not how our system is. It uh, only disconnects the kind of output circuit from the combiner box all the way down to the charge controller. Those are the controlled conductors in our system. Um, you know, kind of what Mark was alluding to. There are some AHJs that may interpret the code to say all of the conductors in the PV system. So between the um, charge controller and the battery bank, the battery bank and the inverter, even the um, inverter output circuit should shut down. Um, we do not currently do that with our system, um, you know, depending on your HJ. So our, our, 
we just shut down the output circuits from the combiner box down to the charge controller. All right. Um, the next question we have, does the ICS plus work on 48 volt systems? Yes. Yep. Correct. All right. Um, next question. Let's see. Um, they're wondering about the purpose of the relay trip breakers at the load center on the charge controller PV inputs. Um, he's wondering if the combiner trips open on rapid shutdown, why is the second breaker required at the charge controller? Yeah, the reason is that the um, on the charge controller, uh, our capacitors may not discharge all the way down. So you could get a back feed from our charge controller side onto that controlled conductor. So uh, we make sure that there's no uh, residual charge coming from our charge controller. So uh, normally the combiner box is the, the PV source, but again, we do could have some residual charge, and that's why we have the, the remote trip breaker on the on the charge controller side. Yeah, that's a, yeah, that's a really good question. And um, the relay trip breaker can actually replace the input breaker to the charge controller in our system. Okay, great, thanks, guys. Um, the next question we have: Does the combiner box need to be mounted vertically, or is it a gasketed box? Um, it actually can be mounted vertically to horizontally. It's listed, it's NEMA 3R, um, listed for vertical to horizontal mounting. Okay. It is, yeah. Um, yeah, here's, here's a long question. Um, here in the Northeast with snowpack on the roof for a couple of months, we tend to avoid NEMA 3R actually on the roof, especially with operating electronics inside. So I'm concerned with your combiner. Um, they're not sure where to mount it. Um, under the array doesn't allow access. On the rack next to the array puts it in the snow. Um, any suggestions? So um, our combiner box is, uh, I think it's four and a half inches, so it is lower profile. Could be mounted um, underneath the PV array. It sounds like you know that installer may not want to do that. Um, we do have our AFCI reset button all, is on the outside of the combiner box. Um, same with you know the disconnect, so it could be mounted and not have to be opened up. Um, I think the only time it would need to be opened up is if a fuse blew. Um, this box is gasketed. Uh, we don't really have any concern. It is NEMA 3R, but um, we don't have a lot of concern with anything entering the box. And one thing that we didn't really go over is um, there are very there are not a lot of preparations in this box. We have a um, back panel um, that all of the components are mounted onto. Um, so, and I don't think we have a good, I'm going to maybe go through some slides and see if I can show that. Um, I think in one of Mark's images we have that, but mm -hmm. there are very few preparations on this box, so um, we don't have a lot of concern of anything getting inside of it. Um, let's there see, go. there's a good image maybe. You can kind of see back here um, slightly, there's actually a back panel where all the components are mounted on, and that's a little bit raised above the um, back of the box. Yeah, and the other thing too is to keep in mind, um, you know, that one of the, the reasons you would need access would be to, to disconnect, um, you know, for, for an arc fault. Let's say we can do that down below with the rapid shutdown. So that eliminates, you know, uh, at least uh, some trips up on the roof. But I think also, you, you know, it's on the, the, the connections and indicator on the right hand side of the panel. So you could Locate it if it if it did fit. If you had the space underneath the array, you could locate it underneath the array, and uh, with you know access, you just need to reach in and for the disconnect switch. There is a test button there also, but that's not something you're going to need to do very often. So the only thing reason to access it would be to you know replace a fuse uh, or the rapid shutdown. The other thing is it does have uh, a pinned hinge. So you can, uh, if you needed access in a tight space, you can unlatch it, move the, the, the lid up, and that releases the pins, and then uh, that gives you easy access. So you don't have to open the lid fully open 180 degrees. You can just push it up, the pins come out, and then you can just lift the lid a couple inches above for access. So there are some other uh, ways you can to gain access in a tight space. 
Great. Uh, we'll move on to our next question. Um, are the ICS plus combiner boxes required for ground mounted systems? No, well, I, I guess it depends. So if you have a ground mount system and your your HJ or your region's requiring arc fault, you may need um, you know the ICS plus solution would meet the arc fault requirement. Um, however, rapid shutdown is only a requirement for systems in your own building. Um, so as long as your conductors, you know your your control conductors aren't more than five feet and going into a building, you wouldn't need rapid shutdown. Okay, great. Um, the next question, I'm not sure exactly what this is referring to, but he asks, does this apply to the VSXR inverters as well as the radian? Um, yeah, this would work with all of our inverter products. Um, and yes, all of them would need, you know, really just depending on your jurisdiction, if they're requiring rapid shutdown um, and or arc fault, um, ICS Plus would work with both of those. As well as our competition. As well as, yeah, as yeah. well as third party solutions. And the other thing too is it's uh, the um, power supply as well as the remote trip breaker. Um, they're all designed to fit into our panel mount slots. Um, so they are designed to work with all of our load centers, um, the FXRs, uh, even the FP1. We, there's a, uh, a special bracket that you can mount uh, the brick control power supply uh, onto the outside. It, it goes like um, right on the outside of where the FNDC would mount on an FP1. You can also use that bracket as an optional way to mount on the outside of the radian load center also. You wouldn't have to mount it on the inside because uh, it can be kind of tight, especially if you have a, a PV pre-wired PV load center. Uh, you could optionally, uh, using the bracket, mount the uh, rear control power supply on the outside. All right, thank you, Mark. And the next question we have. NEC 690.71 says that battery cables more than five feet to the connected equipment require a disco. Does Outback offer a, an RTB for the battery cables? We actually have a disconnect in our um, battery enclosures. Our, um, but not an RTB, not a remote trip. But it, it's not a requirement to be a remote trip. I understand. Yeah. You're asking if we offer one. We don't have one, but um, so if somebody wanted to employ a remote trip breaker for the battery cable, that's a, a lot of current to, to disconnect. But this company um, that makes our DC contactor uh, in the combiner box, they do make larger size DC contact contactors. Um, they're about the only ones in this I know of that makes that because DC current is really tricky to interrupt. It's, it's uh, but when you have current going through a contactor, it's, it's very sticky, <laughs> so it's not easy to interrupt. But they do make them in larger sizes than what's in our combiner box. I don't remember the name of the manufacturer off the top of my head, but uh, you know, if you want to shoot me an email uh, or through contact us through AE, uh, I can get you the name of that manufacturer uh, so you could make up your own design, your own system. But but our, our battery enclosures do have disconnects that meet we that have requirement. But not an RTB, not a remote trip breaker. Yeah, it's not a requirement, but if somebody wants to do it, it's possible. Okay. All right, well, it looks like it wraps up our Q&A session. Thank you so much, Mark and Andrea, for answering all of our great questions today. I just want to remind everyone to complete that survey when you exit the webinar so I can send you a copy of these slides um, for future reference and also to check out the video recording on our YouTube channel. And I forgot to mention earlier, but our YouTube channel also has our um, AE Solar product preview on the ICS Plus Combiner Box. So um, if you want to take a look at that and kind of see, um, you know, some of the great features um, there, we're having um, Outback Power talked with our um, applications engineer, Brad Bassett. So really interesting there. You can find out more about the product. Um, but thank you again, um, Andrea Mark, for uh, presenting with us today. We appreciate it. Thanks, Hannah. Yeah, we, thank you. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity.
All right, and don't forget if you do have any further questions or are interested in the ICS Combiner Box, um, you can talk to your AE sales rep and, and look into placing a pre-order. We'll be shipping these in July, so um, you can place your order today and, and be first in line to get these. So um, we don't want you to miss out. And join us next month, July 22nd, for the next webinar in our monthly webinar series, Rapid Shutdown. So you want to miss that it's more information like this. So very, very valuable. All right. Well, thank you again, everyone, for joining us. And um, have a great weekend.